and I think that should be good. All right, so let's talk about a couple of things. Oh man! So Cinder is finally making her move, and well, let's 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 go with these things in order. The first thing I wanted to talk about is in the intro video. There is, you know, how every every um, during the part of the the intro that says we can't just wait with life at stakes until they think we're ready, and it shows um, different scenes of different groups. You have students walking in the. Uh, the, the the courtyard of Beacon Academy, and then you have the teachers in front of the entrance of the school, and then you have Penny with her military pals in front of, I can't remember what was the background, but I think it was um, some sort of structure with machinery in the background, I think. And then you have, um, with Ironwood, and then you have when the parts of the song says our enemies are gathering the storm is growing deadly um, when it says my our enemies are gathering it shows cinder the mercury and um, emerald and one thing that I kind of notice now is that it's interesting that they put them in a city on fire. The city is just burning. Now I called it city in ruins for some reason. I wrote it down here as city in ruins, but I meant to say a burning city. A burning city. Now, now so far we have not been led astray with all the details and little tidbits of information that the show has presented to us in different areas. And judging from from that scene where the city is burning and then you have all these grim just charging along in the uh in the far in, in the snowy area in the foresty snow area this leads me to believe that we might be witnessing an attack on a city I'm guessing one of the kingdoms now since we have only experienced the kingdom of Vale the kingdom where Beacon Academy is located at Patch Patch is the small town where Ruby is from, but I'm guessing it's part of the kingdom of Vale. I'm going to go with Vale. I'm, I'm almost certain it's Vale. We're going to go with Vale. If I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but Vale. So there's going to be an attack on the kingdom of Vale or somewhere in the city or a place where there's buildings or the... I'm guessing the nearby town area maybe as well where the Beacon Academy is located at. Somewhere where there's population. There's going to be a disaster of sorts or some sort of something. Something is going to happen that is going to cause damage or destruction to the city. A burning city is always a bad omen. Especially when our enemies are gathering. So something to look out for. Also, um, I think I might know the answer to this, but I can't quite remember. Why are there no Grim in the cities? Is it because they built walls and they have kept the Grim out? Because they built their kingdoms. I'm trying to remember the uh, the intro, the original intro, where it talks about 
humanity always facing danger and and struggle with nature and there's creatures of grim that are their sole po purpose is to uh destroy humanity so so they joined together and they created cities and I'm guessing the reason why there's no creatures within the cities is because of the, the walls of swords. So, so something tells me that these walls are going to fall. And there's going to be a lot of Grimm entering the city. And then the city is going to burn. So that's what I'm that's what I'm going for based on the intro. I just wanted to mention that because I just realized it now watching the intro once again. Um the next point I put here I said my sims. There is a game there's a game called My Sims and it's for the Wii, I think it was. And in this game, when the characters are talking to each other, they have all these funny this uh these funny uh, gestures. And they make these funny noises, for example, um, like that. <laughs> and uh, I just I got, I, remi I got reminded of it because um, Neptune, when, when John is talking to Pyrrha in the dance room, and he looks at uh no I'm sorry with with Ruby when John is talking to Ruby, and Ruby tells John that Weiss came alone and then John is like what, and then he looks at Neptune to give him the stink eye. And then Neptune is doing these gestures with Blake and um Sun, with Blake and Sun. And it just reminded me of The Sims. Thank you. <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that uh, punch. Oh, when John says, "Hold my punch," <laughs> I, I'm guessing it was a double inference of I'm gonna beat him down. So hold me back. And uh, John's stupidness. Okay, John is really, really dense. You know, you would think a guy growing up with seven sisters, he would have some sort of psychic female transline connection to how the female mind works. Because he would be exposed to all this estrogen within his household. That he would be a better understanding person as far as how the female mind works but he doesn't he's John and it's disappointing that sometimes he can be so dense so thick that he can't comprehend the messages that are right in front of him um And I'm talking, I'm talking in particular because of when he's like, you look really nice. Am I going to get beat up for it? Okay, for starters, you saw her walking alone. She went up the stairs alone. She's in the balcony alone. And if you haven't seen her all night and you just spotted her and she's alone, chances are... There is a 95% chance, unless the boyfriend is taking a huge dump in the bathroom and he's like been stuck in there for the past 40 minutes, there is a 95% chance that she came here alone. Now, it's bothersome. It's bothersome that he's so dense sometimes. And then, she tells him, she tells him something that I was thinking about because he doesn't know who she is. And bingo. I'm so happy that I was I was on par with that one. I, I, I picked up the signs because when he when Weiss is telling John, you don't know who she is? Not a clue. Um that shows to me that um 
she's become Pira has become separated from everybody else because they hold her in such high regard that it's like it's like a class all by itself and it's funny that she used the word pedestal that they have her up on a pedestal where people can't reach her she's like so high up there and people can't reach her it's like oh well you know she's an idol she's a goddess she's she's just up there and we can never be to that level and it's interesting that she shows that word on the pedestal like if she receives praise or worship is the word I was looking for so that's interesting um, and then she tells him I guess you're the kind of guy I wish I was here with tonight now I'm sorry I'm sorry but when a girl tells you these things that is a a safe way to disclose to you the interest she has for you I guess you're the kind of guy I wish I was here with tonight that's not saying directly I really like you and I want to be with you tonight that's saying I guess you're the kind of guy I like and it's a way of like not completely exposing her heart and I'm I'm guessing it kind of clicked a little bit in John but not to the full extent that that phrase the weight and the power that that phrase carries that's enough to like as soon as that Neptune guy showed up he would just like grab his face and be like excuse me and um just like just like he was doing <laughs> and he can do it you know why let me tell you something just like he was doing when he said hold my punch and then he started walking through the crowd and he's like pushing people that aren't even in his way he's just like pushing them out of the way trying to make his way to neptune that is the exact same attitude that he should have had as soon as neptune showed up in that balcony be like hey you're john right whack <laughs> by the face what <laughs> but he didn't he stopped because it didn't quite have the full effect that it should have had so again I blame it on John's denseness and somewhat stupidity but he's getting there he's 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 a work in progress <laughs> no but seriously you would think growing up with seven sisters seven sisters you would have a better understanding of the female mind. But anyway, so Neptune shows up, and Neptune tells John about the information, and then John takes the back seat. He takes the back seat because he now realizes that on option B, or let's go through the stages, on option A, you have Weiss, and option B, you have Pira. Wise, cold, indifferent, I don't give two craps about you, you mean nothing to me, no, 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 and yes. And then option B, you have Pira, hey, let me help you with your training, hey, you're a great leader, hey, I think you're wonderful, you're the kind of guy that I would like to be here with tonight. And this kind of like offset the scale of option B A being the heaviest and option B now just got this incredible amount of weight that has started outweighing option A. So John decides to take the back seat. Now, in my opinion, has his love and interest for Weiss subsided? No. I don't believe it has. But it has taken a very, very far back of the bus back seat. Now, he talks to, to Neptune, and the reason I say this, the reason I say it's really far in the back of the bus back seat, the reason I say this is because if he lost complete interest 
for Wise. He would have probably not done anything about it and let Wise suffer once he found out that Neptune didn't go with her to the party. He would have been like, eh, screw her, let her go through her problems. That's what she deserves for treating me poorly. But then again, that's not really the character of John. He would probably do something, he would do the right thing. But I believe that with Weiss, he takes the extra step to fix the situation that Neptune and Weiss are in by telling Neptune to go and talk with her. You didn't say, you told you turned her down because you didn't know how to dance. Besides being that cowardice, it's kind of selfish, and you should be better than that. She was really interested in you. Go talk with her. Hang out with her tonight. You don't have to dance, but be with her. Make her night with company and presence that she was really interested in. And that's what he does. He takes the back seat. Are their feelings still there? I believe they are. I believe there's still some sort of affection or interest. Is it friendship? Maybe. Um, so, backseat. Commitment. I wrote down commitment. Oh, because of the promise. John made a wise to, um, to Pira about... Yeah, right. If you don't find anybody to the dance, I'll wear a dress. And lo and behold, he actually held his commitment promise. So John is somebody who is loyal and he is capable of holding true to his word. And like he says, an arc never backs down from his word. It's interesting to see that John holds this value true to his own. <clears throat> Next up, the Seven Scissors. We talked about that. That's a lot of children. <laughs> That's a lot of children. Eight children. And who knows if there's more brothers? He said seven sisters. But how many brothers does he have? Seven brothers. Seven sisters. <laughs> Maybe that's why he's balanced. Um... The next comment I wrote was Weiss realized. This was a growing experience for Weiss because she realized her her cold and her indifferent action towards John the whole time he was interested in her. And despite the fact that she always treated him from a distance and emotionless, cold, not caring, she came to realize that John, despite being mistreated like that, he still was there to look out for her. And I don't know if you noticed, but her face... The whole time she's talking with Neptune, she has the big uh, equals D face that I usually use. The big open smile. So uh, why did you change your mind? Oh, you're looking at him. And then she smiles. She's looking at John. And then when he tells her, you have really good friends looking out for you, her smile kind of becomes a, a sorrowful frown. It's like a smile that turns into a frown. And I'm guessing it got to her, the fact that she was really mean. And it made her think about that towards John. So we might be seeing something about that later on down the line. Um, whatever it was that Cinder... 
opened up in that uh, the I forgot what it's called the the tower the communication tower the the trans Transatlantic Communication Tower? <laughs> Transatlantic, I don't know why I'm saying that, but I don't know. Inter Intercontinental Intercontinental Communication Center. ICC. See? I don't know. I'm making up names, I think. But um, whatever program or thing that she put on the mainframe that kind of like progressed to the other nodes in the uh, communication center. It's interesting that the logo of the program was the chess piece of a queen. And I'm guessing that's her trademark because on the message that Crow sent Ospin, he said, the queen has pawns. So, I'm guessing this confirms that that Cinder is the queen. Unless, unless there's a bigger entity that we're not aware of yet. And, and that one is the pawn the queen and cinder is the pawn working for a much bigger villain in the background the reason i question this is because how in the world did cinder produce a program or knew how to open a program inside the communication center unless she is related to Atlas because from what I understand the communication control tower is uh, there you go the CCCT the continental communication the CCT the CCCT CCCT Communication Continental Communication Center Tower. No. Communication Center Tower. Continental Communication Center. I don't know. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. Okay, focus. Um From what I understand, the CCT or the CCCT was a gift from Atlas to the world, according to Weiss. She told Ruby that Atlas, her country, built these towers. And the biggest one is an Atlas. So, how does Cinder know how to program or enter a program or open a program? I don't know what she did. But I'm going to say she uploaded some sort of virus. Um, put a virus inside the, the communication control tower. And ICCT, Intercontinental Communication Tower. I'm going to go with that one, ICCT. I don't know if it's that one, but I can't remember. Um, so how did Cinder know that, how to do these um, programming things? How does she get support and resources? Where is she getting all this, all these assets? And because I don't, I am starting to doubt if she's capable of producing all these things on her own. I'm, 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 I'm certain somebody, some sort of sponsor is providing her, and she's the main pawn. And she has her little pawns working in the back. So she's like 
she's a mid-level boss before the final boss. She's a lieutenant. She's a lieutenant. I'm going to go with that one. I'm almost certain of it because I just... It's so hard for just one person to come up with all these things. And then nobody suspects her when they see her because if she was famous or if she had a lot of income or if she had a lot of power or resources, when she showed her face on Beacon Academy, people would recognize her and be like, oh my goodness, it's you. But there's a hidden figure working from the shadows. It has to be. This hidden identity is using Cinder to do its bidding. That's what I'm going to say. Unless later on down the line we find that she has this hidden thing where she sells and she has multiple companies that work under different names or something really complex and elaborate. I don't know. Um, next up, Dust and Dress. I saw it. Whatever she was sewing, when she would materialize her weapons or use the dust powder to create objects that she would later launch, um, her dress lights up. And it was the legs and the arms, the sleeves. And the uh, the slacks of her sneaking suit. <laughs> so dust embedded in in the dress or in clothing. And then the last thing, no, there's two things. When um, when the guards came looking for Cinder inside the uh, the assembly hall, the DJ's playing music. I'm guessing it was a cameo shout out to the the Daft Punk band because they had their robot the masks Penny looks so cute and lastly the tattoo on her back it's interesting that or at least as far as I remember up until now I don't think I've seen tattoos on people Except for Cinder, or at least Cinder is the one that so far has stood out the most. So I'm 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 sorry, I'm mixing or I'm combining the the World of Repnet video that we saw about dust where it talks about even fusing the dust within their bodies. Now I noticed when, when she was materializing her weapons, besides her sleeves glowing, her eyes were also... Oh my gosh, her eyes! And then, in the intro, when she's sitting and she looks up, her eye is releasing some sort of energy. Like a little flame of sorts when she's looking up at the warships coming in. This girl. This girl has dust embedded into her body. I'm almost certain of it. The eyes. It's all about the eyes. The eyes are so meaningful in this series. I talked about Ruby's eyes, and now Cinder's eyes, they light up whenever she's using her um, dust energy of sorts. <clears throat> and that's it. That's, that's, that's all the things I gathered from this episode. So, thank you so much for watching. This gives me a lot to think about, actually. This is really... This is really interesting.
This is interesting. But um, we'll cut it here. Holy crap, 48 minutes. Um, that's it. I've got nothing else for now. So thank you so much for watching another episode of Watch Along with Char Fox. <laughs> that's me. Um, yeah, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. If you would leave a comment on your thoughts, I would greatly appreciate it. I try to respond to everybody's comment. And if you're new to this channel, welcome and enjoy your stay. <laughs> and if you want to be notified of when I upload new videos, go ahead and uh, sign up to be notified. And... And if you're interested in supporting what I do, then sign up for Patreon and become a sponsor for me. And that's it. <laughs> I gotta find a way to organize that better so it kind of like rolls off the tongue when I say it. So I'll think about something later on. Um, thank you so much for watching and uh, take care. Bye bye.